going to talk, well, it's quite, it goes on quite well from the previous talk, because I'm going to talk about uh, evolution, but at a kind of later stage. Um, so, like many people, I'm fascinated with evolution and the fact of the existence of life and so on. It seems, it struck me uh, that there is nature's number one learning algorithm is asexual evolution. And then, perhaps a billion years after that started, we have nature's number two learning algorithm, which is sexual evolution. Um, these are both kind of adaptive. Uh, there is enormous, I come from machine learning. Uh, there is almost no recognized overlap between these and machine learning. Um, and it's, this struck me as very strange. I'm first of all going to talk about maybe some basic informational considerations about genetic codes. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to uh, uh, try to make a connection between sexual evolution and, non, and uh, an aspect of machine learning called non-parametric Bayesian Markov chain Monte Carlo. These are these two algorithms. Nature's first algorithm, we have things which copy, they mutate, and they are selected, and that repeats. The sexual algorithm is different in that you copy, and, but recombine. So we get each new organism is a mixture of the previous genomes, and then select. These are different algorithms. And so perhaps it's not surprising that they seem to produce very different results. So this is just a little table that compares some aspects of organisms that evolve sexually from those which evolve asexually. It's not often you can put up a table of properties which vary by either a complete qualitative difference or they vary by at least three orders of magnitude, uh, but in each of those they do. The, I think it's a particularly curious that those organisms which we think of as being most complex, such as elephants and whales and so on, are also the ones which reproduce most slowly and with the smallest populations. That's very strange. Um, so something, there must be something very special uh, about the uh, uh, encoding specifications in the genomes of sexual organisms. Well, what is it? Well, let's consider another wonderful fact uh, that uh, horses and donkeys are believed to have diverged at least four million years ago. And if you breed a horse with a donkey, you reliably get a mule uh, horses and donkeys actually have different numbers of chromosomes. Uh, you get a mule, and mules are both stronger and are reputed to be more intelligent than both. Can we do the same with our own artifacts? Here is a nice wild Alaskan Boeing and a fetching Airbus. Well, we would breed them by randomly using cut and paste to recombine the designs and then adding about 100 random errors I, this probably, the experiment has not been tried. Um, but the point I'm making is that human design machines and biological organisms are specified in exceedingly different ways. Hmm. Um, the boldest statement about genetic architecture is something called the armogenic hypothesis, which is, I believe, controversial. But genome-wide association studies uh, that they've, people have figured out, this is, this is unquestionably true that there are very many places on the genome where variations affect every complex tray. And in this study, uh, used height, a very basic tray, and found that uh, suggestive evidence that there are, base, there are millions of locations on the genome where variations can affect height. And these are distributed over the entire genome uh, involving nearly every gene. Wow, if true. Let's switch to abstraction, because I'm a computer scientist. Think about limitative informational properties of sexual and asexual evolution, considering a very simple model, and see what we find. Um, this model is essentially the same one that's been considered by many people, and I think the clearest uh, exposition was by David Mackay in his book on information theory. We consider genomes as binary sequences of some fixed length. We choose some fixed target or ideal genome. In each generation, we breed two n children, and we select from those the path which are closest in the sense that they match in the greatest number of places with the target. 
It's not intended to be in any way a realistic model. It's intended to be a limitative model. Every assumption is optimistic. In this way, we can get upper bounds on achievable complexity. How do we do that? So let's take a plot. We plot the genome. Let's fix our mutation rate, our per locus mutation rate. Have a population size. The population size relative to mutation rate is a little large for biology. but. Let's, um, and we plot the fraction of incorrect elements in the genome versus the gen length of the genome on a log scale. We notice that these are indeed very different algorithms, that sexual evolution is much better to eliminating mismatches than asexual evolution is, considering very long genomes relative to mutation rate. So up to a genome of length about 100, if one in 100 locations mutate, we get on average one mutation per gene per genome per generation. So we can evolve to a pure population which are all the same as the target. Since there are uh, uh, two to the 100 possible targets, uh, I claim we can evolve to two to the 100 uh, different final populations, so we can put in about 100 bits by selection. How many Oh, this is to equilibrium, which happens pretty quickly. Um, as you increase the length of the genome, so say 10,000, um, now we've got about 100 mutations per genome in each copying. And so it's impossible to have a selected population which is identical to the target, which is also of length 10,000. Now, there are two to the 10,000 possible targets, but around each, tar each, tar each target, there is a hamming ball where you can pretty much guarantee your population is going to be. Now, how many of these achievable varieties are there? And the answer is going to be very different for sexual and asexual. Notice that, that these, this, this fraction of incorrect elements will asymptote to 0.5 as the general length goes to infinity, but this, has, this happens at different rates. So just let's plot the, I'm going to argue that it is indeed a channel capacity, but clearly let's plot 1 minus the base 2 entropy of the uh, a, a fraction of agreements times the length of the genome. Um, and we see that there is completely different behavior for sexual and asexual evolution here. That for asexual evolution, it doesn't matter how long your genome is, you still get exactly the same amount. There's no advantage to having a long genome. For sexual evolution, you have this curious situation where if you make long genomes, which will not match the target, and in an evolved population, you don't know which ones places will match the target and which won't, then uh, you get apparently vastly more information. You don't often see information on a log scale. Information is already a logarithm. Here we've got ten time, more than 10 times more bits. Actually, under the most optimistic construction, uh, uh, the uh, amount of information in a sexual population asymptotes with the long, as, as the genome length tends to infinity to one over the mutation rate squared. Mutation rates tend to be a small number. So the question is, huh, is this part of the secret of sexual evolution? Can we have long genomes full of things which are not conserved, but nevertheless, the organism is by some complex and rich developmental process making use of all that information to construct a reliable structure, a strong mule? Oh, this is an argument that we can indeed regard it as a channel capacity, and this measure of information is indeed a, a measure of the uh, number of possible varieties that we can put in. Okay, but we're going to go over that. Um, it turns out one's first thought is to evolve 100-bit organisms, um, but uh, decode them using standard error-correcting codes from much longer genomes and see if we get a small number of extra bits, but not nearly as many as one would like. Um, let's take the example, again, just to give fix a little bit of intuition, uh, of stabilizing selection, an important case. Selection that maintains a quantitative tray, a design parameter close to an optimal value. Um, the typical model of genetic arch architecture most widely used, and in fact the one used to breed every piece of food you eat, um, is of linear effects. Um, 
And basically, it doesn't work very well for stabilizing selection. Uh, two things can go wrong. With small effects, you can't eliminate them because a small effect is going to have hardly any consistent effect upon the um, optimal distance from the optimal value. And large effects, um, they, you can't change them. Um, to cut a story short, here is a, a model organism selected with two numbers. Its phenotype is just two numbers. Here's a histograms under linear selection. The point of this example is that you can, with some difficulty, devise functions from very long bit strings, which do indeed give you much more precise stabilizing selection. You might say, why not use binary? The answer is that if you use binary, things go horribly wrong. The, in the, the, re, the way that they go horribly wrong um, is that uh, uh, the, the, the adaptive landscape has a very unfortunate local minima. So let's go. This isn't many of you are physicists. What I've just done, said has probably switched you off a little bit because it looked unnecessarily complicated. I suddenly pulled this slow adaptation thing out of a hat. Is there a unifying simplicity? How do we even think about evolution of evolvability? Is there a connection to machine learning and so on? Can we relate genetic algorithms? If genetic algorithms are this entirely sociologically separate field with their own mystical beliefs about the algorithms they develop. Hmm. Um, so the idea is yes. Let me skip forward to some design decisions. How can I design a genetic algorithm which is going to give me a Markov chain of populations which satisfies detailed balance? I can write down the stationary distribution. I can apply all the techniques of Monte Carlo, and I can relate it to machine learning and Bayesian inference. The answer is like this. Number one, you breed one genome at a time and get rid of one. It's overlapping, gener overlapping generations. Number two, you sample each part of your new genome from corresponding elements of randomly chosen members of your population. So you abandon the two parents. But this is a commonly made, this is a relatively harmless assumption for many purposes. Three is more interesting. Here we are saying mutations are like innovations in Dirichlet processes. You take, a, you cannot let your mutation depend on the previous value. You drag a mutation by sampling from a pool. The interesting one here is during fourth, during breeding, you make all members of the population contribute equally. So that in nearly every model of genetics and selection, um, with selection and every genetic algorithm, people breed more from their fitter individuals in the population. But um, if you separate fitness from propensity to breed, we make all breeding equal, the breeding process becomes much simpler. We can make the breeding process one of exchangeable sampling. Uh, and then if we let fitness enter at the point of rejection only, then the lifetime fitness of an organism is proportional to its lifetime. Uh, and so we've really got something which is looking a lot more like Metropolis Hastings. Actually, it is Metropolis Hastings. We can do a tournament selections to decide who to reject and so on. I won't take you through this. It's, oh, now we get, this is a stationary distribution over genomes. What we get is a prior, it's the factorizes into a prior term. This is the equilibrium distribution when we have no selection. We allowed all the Fs to be one times the product of all the fitnesses, um, which is, acts like a likelihood. It's a very slight generalization of uh, 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 Bayesian models. Um, we, we, our likelihoods don't have to be normalized. Um, oh, this is a proof that it satisfies detailed balance. What happens if you have a population of one? The answer is that what you get is straight Metropolis Hastings. We a genetic algorithm with population size one. We breed another. We propose another one, something from this one, and a pool of mutations somewhere over here. And then we select one of them uh, stochastically. Um, oh, oh, sorry. This is a sorry. This is fine. Um, the genetic algorithm. You breed uh, a standard genetic algorithm with non-overlapping generations. You have one parent. You breed two children. 
you throw away the parent, then you select a better child. This does not work out well um, as a Markov Monte, Chain, Monte Carlo algorithm. How do you even think about evolution of evolvability? Well, the answer is, within this framework, the structure is already given in hierarchical Bayesian models. Essentially, instead of considering fluctuating environments over time, you can take a static picture where you have many related environments which induce different fitness functions here in different populations, and they are connected by all of them taking mutations, if you like, migration from the same gene pool. This is a standard technique in hierarchical Bayesian inference using these. Now, in Bayesian terms, the fitness is like a likelihood model. We have somewhat different likelihoods. Statisticians don't do this. They think these are given. The populations, these are samples of latent variables. You're trying to find assignments of latent variables, which will give you high fitness in all these different populations at the same time. The populations are linked because they draw their mutations from the same gene pool. You never see the gene pool, but you infer what it is in that uh, uh, the, the, this, um, we have, as it were, one-way migration from a continent uh, where um, we, never, we never see what's on the continent, but we infer it, and these populations um, have to be similar, and therefore we need, a, we need a theorem, which I don't have, that populations which are, have, take migration from the same place in this sense are co-evolvable. Learning, intelligence, and agency my first remark here is that for all but a very, very few highly sophisticated animals, us, learning and cognitive development consist of unpacking genetic information into behavior. Behavior is innate. The task of development is using experience to calibrate our nervous system to do what our genes are telling us to. Um, and the learning it wants to use as little experience as possible. With this MCMC approach, we can put evolutionary and individual learning into one probability model. Evolutionary roles of this kind of entry-level learning, which isn't as sophisticated as sort of human you know, scientific discovery, um, I would distinguish three possible roles. One is situation-adaptive learning. An organism is born, it doesn't know what environment it's going to go in, be in. It picks up information about the environment in order to behave appropriately. Um, I, perception is moment-to-moment -moment learning of this type. Secondly, decompression. Learning decodes a compact, easily genetically, informationally compact description of behavior, into your reward system, into actual behavior. And third, I can only, this is, we've shifted from things I have done to things I'm gonna do here that learning resolves inconsistencies in genetic specification. To put this poetically, you have inconsistent, incomplete, and contradictory descriptions of what to do from the genomes of both of your parents, and your life experience is trying to make these things consistent and, and, and derive some reasonable adult behavior from it. Thank you. <laughs>